As always, a big thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash the Cyberwire. Maybe today is the day that you will become a supporter of the Cyberwire. We do appreciate it. FireEye warns of patient reconnaissance on the part of the probably Iranian APT-34. The electronic ghosts of the Caliphate have so far failed to say boo, except maybe in South Jersey. Flaws are discovered in mobile banking apps. A bike-sharing service leaked data. Bitcoin's bubble, Microsoft patches its malware protection engine, and biometrics have come to the beagles. Your pet door can now recognize Rover or Boots and let them on in. The raccoon pals stay outside. Now I'd like to tell you about a white paper from our sponsor Delta Risk. More than 90% of companies are using the cloud. Although the benefits are clear, moving to the cloud comes with new and unique security challenges. In the white paper, Understanding the Challenges of Cloud Monitoring and Security, Delta Risk cloud security experts outline the key methods organizations can adapt to gain clearer visibility into their network and critical assets. You can get your copy of the white paper by visiting deltarisk.com slash whitepapers hyphen cloud monitoring. Delta Risk LLC, a Chertoff Group company, is a global provider of cybersecurity services to commercial and government clients. Learn more about Delta Risk by visiting deltarisk.com. And we thank Delta Risk for sponsoring our show. major funding for the Cyberwire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire summary for Friday, December 8th, 2017. Iranian threat groups, Charming Kitten among them, the group associated with hacking HBO, have attracted more attention this week. More serious than hacking a television show are reports of Tehran's hackers having made quiet inroads into compromising Western infrastructure, especially the U.S., No major attacks are reported, but security organizations have their eyes open. FireEye has been tracking the Iranian threat group they call APT-34 since 2014. Its activities have affected targets in the Middle East, and it appears to be continuing its patient, quiet reconnaissance of infrastructure targets. Iranian cyber operators are believed responsible for attacks on U.S. infrastructure in the past, notably financial services targets, and far less serious in effect, but arguably more disturbing in its implications, the small Bowman Street flood control dam in Rye, New York. FireEye says its attribution of APT-34 to Iran is an assessment of moderate confidence. The group has modified its approach to take advantage of new exploits and vulnerabilities as they're discovered. It has used malicious Excel macros and PowerShell exploits to move within networks, and it's also shown some extensive social engineering chops in social media, where it's used bogus or compromised accounts to get close to the organizations it's targeting. FireEye says in its report that they are a capable group that seems to have access to its own development resources. FireEye concludes, quote, We assess that APT34's efforts to continuously update their malware demonstrate the group's commitment to pursuing strategies to deter detection, end quote. There are other threat actors with Middle Eastern connections who don't show the capabilities of the APTs that appear to be operating from Iran. Prominent among these are the various hacktivist cells faithful to ISIS, who can be expected to step up their threats as the caliphate's territory has now effectively vanished. ISIS hacktivists and official online media have excelled at recruitment and inspiration, and these have been dangerous and the source of much suffering. But proper hacking hasn't advanced much beyond low-grade vandalism of poorly secured sites. You've seen the sort of thing, an online card catalog for a public library, say in Lower Crab Cake, Maryland, is vandalized to show a gif of the White House in flames. Stuff like that. So today is the day ISIS promised to bring America to its knees with a massive cyber attack. A video posted by adherents of the terrorist group promised... We will face you with a massive cyber war, black days you will remember. The specific group making the threat was the Electronic Ghosts of the Caliphate, or the Caliphate's Cyber Ghosts. But as we publish today, the only sign of ISIS hacking appears to have been some defacement of the Gloucester Township website. We believe this is the Gloucester Township in southern New Jersey. The Lions of the Caliphate will be at your door, is what Fleet Street's Daily Mail reported was said. But when we looked, it all seemed in order. 
The mayor's picture was up, and he's smiling and looking good. We can't even confirm what the Daily Mail reported, and if you're the Gloucester Township at whom the lions of the caliphate roared, let us know. Researchers at the University of Birmingham report finding flaws in a banking security app that exposed the data of millions of bank customers to credential theft. It's a vulnerability that opens the apps to man-in-the-middle attacks. The app's cryptographically signed certificate seems to have failed to verify the server's host name when the app connected with it. Man-in-the-middle attacks could intercept usernames and passwords during online banking sessions, and these could lead to account hijacking and, of course, theft. Fixes are for the most part in, accompanied by much tut-tutting from the security industry about slipshod app development. It's not just gig-economy ride-sharing outfits who have to deal with leaks, it's bike-sharing operations, too. Obike, the widely used bicycle sharing app, is investigating a leak that may have affected users in some 14 countries. This one appears to have come from a gap in Obike's API, one intended to allow users to refer friends to the service. The information exposed was relatively benign, as such information goes, names and ride locations, not passwords or credit card numbers, but the exposure is still unsettling. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency prices are way up in a major speculative bubble, and criminal attention is enthusiastically keeping pace. Why are people saying bubble? Because the price of Bitcoin jumped from $12,000 to $15,000 this week, with comparisons being made to the tulip bubble of 1636, which crashed spectacularly in February of 1637. If you're one of those who takes historical lessons seriously, get a copy of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds from your library. If you're one of those who thinks history is bunk, well, perhaps you'd be interested in an investment in Vopercoin, available at most of the Burger Kings in Greater Moscow. Microsoft has issued an emergency out-of-band patch to its malware protection engine. It's a remote code execution flaw present in Windows Defender, Microsoft Security Essentials, Endpoint Protection, Forefront Endpoint Protection, and Exchange Server 2013 and 2016. A memory corruption error in the malware scanner is what opens the door to exploitation. And finally, Biometrics has come to the Beagles. If you've been worried about some random animal walking in and out of your house via the unsecured pet door without so much as a buy your leave, Redmond may have a solution for you. A pet door that acts like a bouncer on a Studio 54 rope line. The Microsoft solution recognizes your pet's face, letting in Snoopy and Garfield, but keeping out Tom, Jerry, Marmaduke, raccoons, possums, squirrels, wombats, mongooses, and so on. We're a BYOD shop here, bring your own dog, so naturally this caught our eye. There's an emphasis, an overemphasis we might say, on cats, but we assume that the system works with other pets as well. Dogs, iguanas, rabbits, skunks, chameleons, hamsters, ferrets, hermit crabs, the whole ark full. Why shouldn't it? You'd think that Microsoft's experience with Tay the Teenage AI's misspent adolescence would have taught them to be properly inclusive. Hold the door open for your companion Chuckwalla or pet Periwinkle. Now I'd like to share a message from our sponsor, Nehemiah Security. Fellow cybersecurity leaders, when your CEO asks department heads for a status update, do you envy your colleagues like the VP of Sales or CFO who only have to pull a report from a single system. Instead of deploying a team of people to check multiple systems and then waiting for them to report back, do you wish you had a single place to get the information you need to communicate with the CEO? Nehemiah Security is here to put that power in the hands of the cybersecurity leader. It's time for a quick solution that allows you to go to one place to get the security information you need, quickly and in business terms your CEO can understand. Nehemiah Security gives cybersecurity leaders the ability to report cyber risk in terms of dollars and cents. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com to learn more and get a free customized demo just for CyberWire listeners. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com today. That's N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H Security.com. And we thank Nehemiah Security for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Chris Poulin. He's a principal and director for Booz Allen's Dark Labs, where they focus on IoT security and machine intelligence. Chris, welcome back. You know, um, our editor here at the CyberWire, John Petrick, uh, recently came back from an ICS conference. I believe it was in Atlanta. And 
He made the observation that the IT people seem to be optimistic about uh, security, but the operational people seem to be pessimistic about security. What's your insight on that? (laughs) So it is interesting because another trend that we've been seeing is that IT and OT has been converging for a while. So, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was let's separate these things and have an air gap. And interestingly, the CISO, who's traditionally overseeing the IT side, is now being given the purview over the OT side as well. However, not necessarily the authority, because if you think about it, um, the OT side in many businesses is where the money is made. And so any downtime on the OT side often means direct impact on revenue. And so what ends up happening is that the CISO doesn't necessarily have authority, even though he or she has purview over it. But the thing that the plant operators know is that those systems on on the OT side of the house are fairly fragile. You can't just go in with an IT vulnerability scanner and scan the whole thing. In fact, you can't even ping the whole. You can't ping those things. Um, many cases, they'll just plain old fall over. And so, you know, to some extent, that's one of the fears is that the IT side is going to come in and just sort of tromp through the living room with muddy boots. You know, mm-hmm. they don't really understand OT. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is that there's the language is not the same either. So, for example, in IT, we talk about cybersecurity. We all know what we mean. You know, it's and it's important and we take it seriously. And that's taken some years, by the way, to get to where we are now. On the OT side, they don't talk about cyber in that sense because the most important things are availability. So having continuous uptime and safety and then tertiary is uh, is compliance. You know, regulatory compliance. So when you start talking about cyber, they don't necessarily make it sounds like an IT term to a lot of the plant operators, and they don't necessarily equate that with what's important to them, which is availability and safety. And so I think that's one of the things that needs to happen is that the IT side needs to become a little bit more familiar with what happens on the OT side and start speaking the same uh, language. And then I believe that this, you know, this trend will start to uh, temper out a little bit, right? And then they'll start to come together, which is, hey, if you go in as an IT person, say, we understand what you're doing, we understand how important it is to the business, and we understand availability and safety, um, and we want to help you because cyber actually impacts those things, then I think that's when we'll all sort of come together and uh, OT and IT will finally uh, converge and everybody will become one. Kumbaya. <laughs> Uh, We we can all hope, right? If only it were that easy. (laughs) Chris Pullen, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you once again. Now I'd like to share an important upcoming opportunity from our sponsor, Cybrick. On December 12th, DevSecOps experts from global payment solutions provider Visa and Cybrick with a first-of-its-kind continuous application security platform are teaming up for a webinar to talk enterprise cyber threat survival. How can you protect your organization against the devastating breaches you hear about all the time in the CyberWire? Swapnil Deshmukh, Senior Director of Emerging Technologies Security for Visa, and Mike Kyle, CTO at Cybrick, will weigh in. They'll talk about how rapid innovation and continuous delivery via DevOps exposes organizations to a constant evolving cyber threat and how seamlessly embedding continuous security within existing ecosystems will enforce security across production environments. Join them for this insightful and information-packed webinar on December 12, 2017 at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. You can learn more and register today at thecyberwire.com slash cybric. That's thecyberwire.com slash C-Y-B-R-I-C. And we thank Cybric for sponsoring our show. My guest today is Adam Siegel. He's director of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations, where they've recently launched an online cyber operations tracker. The Council is a nonpartisan, independent foreign policy think tank. Uh, We take no official positions and no uh, government money. Uh, And our mission is to um, educate the American people about uh, foreign policy issues that will affect them and hopefully um, help create uh, better policies to pursue American interests. So you all have taken on this task of tracking state-sponsored cyber operations. Um, what led you to taking this on? So 
So I think we felt like there was growth and interest in uh, state operations just because of all the reporting about uh, hacking. Um, But there was a lot of, I think, confusion um, about what states were doing, why they were doing it, uh, who was involved, just because of some of the inconsistencies um, in reporting uh, across events. And so uh, what is your approach to this tracking system? We have tried to collect every publicly re- reported um, operation that uh, has um, sort of multiple sources, um, both uh, media and cybersecurity and other governments. Um, we've tried to find uh, more than one report for, for an event and um, then publicly list them. Um, we realize the data is going to be incomplete. Uh, probably lots of operations have happened but have not been either uh, tracked by companies or governments uh, or haven't been reported. Um, And so actually on the website, uh, we also have a reporting function. So people uh, in the industry or others uh, can help us uh, point out things that we've missed. What do you see uh, taking place in terms of uh, the evolution of the role of cybersecurity in geopolitics? Looking at the timeline, we see the vast majority of attacks are, are espionage. Um, and so states um, were using uh, cyber operations primarily to collect information uh, on adversaries, or on uh, activists, on civil rights groups. Uh, and then a huge chunk of that um, was also uh, Chinese threat actors uh, collecting uh, intellectual property or business secrets for a competitive advantage of, of Chinese firms. Uh, as you move through the timeline in particular over the last two or three years, um, you start seeing a decline of the Chinese operations, uh, in part driven by the agreement between the United States and China, um, but also a a slow uptick on more disruptive uh, and destructive attacks, um, uh, data destruction, uh, ransomware, and and other um, operations. Do you see this being a situation where ultimately we're going to have to have uh, things like treaties that will take care or, or uh, address cybersecurity issues? Yeah, so there's a there's been a, a large push uh, driven in part by the United States to develop uh, norms or rules of the road for cyberspace. Mm. Um, I don't think treaties are very likely um, just be give just because um, you know most of our arms control treaties are based on some forms of control and verification, right? We can count how many uh, nuclear missiles there are or how many ICBMs there are. We can, we can uh, inspect factories. Uh, none of that's going to be available in the malware space. You can't really inspect and make sure people are not developing weapons. So we're going to have to come up with some kind of shared agreements upon what is considered um, legitimate behavior. I think that's going to be very, very hard to do for everything under um, a use of force or an armed attack. So it, right now, it would be fairly clear to the response if an, a cyber attack caused physical destruction or, or, or death. Um, the United States has, has stated that it would act like it would for any other type of physical attack that caused destruction or death. So we might get some agreements with the Russians or, or the Chinese in that space because neither of those countries really want uh, a cyber um, engagement to escalate to physical conflict. We may decide that certain types of critical infrastructure should be off limits or at least have some greater understanding of what a threshold for use of force might be. The problem is is that everything below that line, um, espionage, DDoS attacks, doxing, information operations, all those other areas where, where states are most active, that's going to be very, very difficult to get any type of agreement. I think it's very unlikely. Yeah, it strikes me that um, that nations have been reticent, I mean, the United States in particular, has been reticent to to draw any lines in the sand when it comes to those flavors of cyber attacks. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, states have been pretty reluctant generally because nobody's really sure how the capacities are going to develop and how important they're going to be uh, and so nobody wants to restrain themselves before they before they know. Um, but I think also, you know, for the U.S., the Snowden revelation certainly suggests that the U.S. is pretty good at uh, espionage and conducting these operations. And so uh, it has not been interested in having a broader treaty. The Russians and Chinese have said, well, this is a new technology. We, we need to have uh, new treaties. 
And their def- definition of cybersecurity is more expansive. It includes uh, what, what the Chinese and Russians would call information security. So the, the concern about content and the free flow of information. And so it's been very hard for the U.S. to come up with some shared definitions below the threshold of, a, of an armed attack. That's Adam Siegel from the Council on Foreign Relations. You can learn more about their cyber operations tracker by visiting their website, cfr.org, and searching for cyber. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you, they use artificial intelligence, check out silence.com. The CyberWire podcast is produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.